With a look at all the latest from around the world now, it's the ITV Lunchtime News. An extreme weather warning for the future. From high heat to flash flooding, our country's climate is getting more and more severe. The heat waves are going to become more frequent and more intense. The flooding events are going to become more extreme and more record breaking. Also this lunchtime for the third week running, a record number of people pinged by the NHS app in England and Wales. More medals for Team GB in Tokyo, but COVID threatens to overshadow events as more competitors test positive and... I'm Edward. I'm John and we're 17 and we're from Dublin. The show that brought us Jedward, One Direction and Little Mix is leaving our screens. It's a goodbye to The X Factor. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Lucrezia Millerini. Good afternoon. Scientists have laid out their clearest warning yet of the damaging effects of climate change on our country. The Met Office's latest report confirms our nation is getting hotter and huge showers that cause flash flooding are becoming a feature of our lives. And the forecasts are only getting more severe. In future, summer temperatures could regularly exceed 40 degrees Celsius. As our political reporter, Shehab Khan, explains solutions are in short supply. 2020 saw some incredibly significant climate events here in the United Kingdom. In February in Shrewsbury and Ironbridge, the River Severn breached flood barriers. In August, we had the hottest day for 17 years. And in December, winds reached more than 100 miles an hour as Storm Bella hit our shores. These are just some of the examples, and a new scientific report says that more disruptive climate change events could become the norm. So we're going to see more of these climate extremes as we go forward in time. The heat waves are going to become more frequent and more intense. The flooding events are going to become more extreme and more record breaking. And so we need to see not only the pledges and the policies that are being made by government, but we need to see action. The report also found that 2020 was the third warmest year in the United Kingdom since 1884. It was also the fifth wettest year and the eighth sunniest on record. No other year is in the top ten on all three criteria. Scientists say we need to cut carbon emissions immediately if we're going to stop this. What's your plan to do that? We were the first G7 country, the first major country uh, to legislate for net zero by 2050. And of course, we're hosting COP26 because it's not just enough for the UK to, to demonstrate leadership. So we're bringing countries together to make sure we're ambitious about um, uh, emission cuts, but also that we provide the international climate finance for the poorer countries around the world to make those changes as well. As extreme weather conditions become more frequent, emergency services bear the brunt as call volumes tend to shoot up. As the temperature increases, we see a lot of patients with um, existing medical problems, especially the older patients with chronic lung problems, respiratory problems, uh, and due to the high temperature, their conditions are exacerbated. These flash floods from a few days ago serve as a reminder of the situation we're in. And the government will hope that the COP26 climate change conference that they're hosting this year can help coordinate an international response. Shihab Khan, ITV News. Next, there has been the rise in the number of people who have been pinged by the NHS app and told to stay at home and self-isolate. Royal Health Editor Emily Morgan is here. So, Emily, talk us through these latest figures. Well, they're quite extraordinary. I mean, a huge rise in the number of people who've been pinged. That's the sort of how people like to, to, to call it. Um, and told to isolate for 10 days because they've been in contact with someone who's had COVID. Here are the stats. There's 689,000 pings that were sent out from the NHS COVID app from between the 15th and the 21st of July and 536,000 people had been contacted via test and trace. So that's over a million people who were told to isolate. Now, this has been hugely controversial recently, obviously, because businesses are just really struggling to be able to operate properly because so many of their workforce are off at the moment. Of course, there are some people who are now exempt, people who work in critical industries like travel, health, uh, food industries. So they will be testing 
instead. But massive frustration still for the people who are sitting at home, many of whom never test positive for COVID. Uh, and they can't go out, they can't go to work. Come the 16th of August, obviously this is going to change, but all these figures are just going to add to the calls for the government to bring that date forward. Yeah, Emily, thank you. And the pandemic is also causing problems in Tokyo, which is casting a huge shadow over the Olympics. More competitors have been forced to isolate and daily cases across Japan as a whole have exceeded 10,000 for the first time ever. Meanwhile, Team GB have won a silver in the canoe slalom and bronze in shooting, taking their overall total to 18 medals. Our sports editor, Steve Scott, is in Tokyo. He has all the details. Well, it's been a relatively slow day for Team GB today. Uh, the best they've come up with is a silver medal. Not bad. Mallory Franklin in the C1 uh, canoeing, but elsewhere not great success. There was a bronze for Matt Coward Holly in the trap shooting. Disappointment uh, for the rowers today. Um, Helen Glover, who has had three children since she last competed in the Olympic Games in Rio, was coming back to try and get her third successive gold with Polly Swan. They came in fourth, so Jess missed out. Uh, so did the double skulls. And that was really, really close. That was a photo finish. So heartbreaking for them. So all in all, not the um, not the medal rush that we've been used to uh, since the games began for Team GB. The athletics, by the way, that starts tomorrow. Headlining for GB, of course, will be the athletics captain, Dina Asher-Smith. She'll be in the 100 metres heats. And there was a little bit of scare around athletics today. An American poll voter has uh, tested positive for COVID. As a result, those training with him, some Australians, uh, were put into isolation, as well as the rest of the team, 60-strong team, uh, as a precaution. Since then, they've all been tested. They've uh, investigated who was uh, in close contact with who. And now all but three of the Australians have been released. But I think it gives an indication of how precarious this Games is when it comes to COVID. And at times, it really feels like they're all operating on a knife edge. Steve Scott, they're reporting from Tokyo. Well, here the number of people using the furlough scheme has fallen sharply, with young people moving off the government scheme fastest. New figures show 1.9 million people were still furloughed at the end of June, the lowest level since the start of the pandemic, and half a million fewer than in May. And Wayne Rooney has apologised to his wife and his club, his football club, after pictures emerged of him asleep in a hotel room surrounded by young women. The former England captain, who now manages Derby County, initially claimed he'd been blackmailed, but police dropped the complaint. The Justice Secretary has told ITV News he is considering extending the use of separation centres inside jails for convicted terrorists. The centres have become known as prisons within prisons because they keep terrorists separate from other inmates. They might radicalise, but some believe they could create further problems. Well, UK editor Paul Brown is here. Paul, um, you were the first ever to be given access to one of these cells, weren't you? Why is the Justice Secretary such a fan? Well, look, actually, there are around 30 of these cells across three separation centres in the UK, and we understand that only about a third of them are actually in use. They were introduced just a few years ago with the idea being that they could separate out some of the most radicalised minds from the rest of the prison population to prevent them from recruiting other prisoners to their extremist cause. But as we saw at HMP Franklin, where we filmed for the first time, they're not without controversy because there's a risk that if you separate, you also elevate the status of these terrorists. They get to mix with like-minded extremist heroes in their eyes and potentially radicalise one another further. But when I put that to the Justice Secretary in this exclusive interview, uh, he told us that he accepts that actually some of these terrorists are just simply beyond reform and that he does want to look at making it easier. He is looking at making it easier to move them into these separation centres. Here's the real balance for us. By separation, do you actually make the position worse? Do you end up creating a college of criminality that is even more intense than uh, what is happening in the mainstream prison? Or by not doing it, do you allow that person to proselytise and influence uh, other prisoners, some of whom have had no connection with terrorism in the past? And that's why I'm committed to reviewing the process to make sure that it is as streamlined and as straightforward as possible. But as part of our access to the prison system, we've also been speaking to the psychologists who work one-to-one -one with some of Britain's most dangerous terrorists. You can see more from them on News at 10 tonight. And to the imams, too, who offer religious guidance to some of these people who are so set on this criminal calling. All right, Paul, thank you.
still to come. A first for Phantom of the Opera, we meet the first black actor to play Christine in the West End. And the X Factor is axed after 17 years. But first, an insight into just how destructive alcohol can be. By the time Toby Winston was 25, he was drinking so much he had liver disease and had to use a wheelchair. On ITV's Tonight programme this evening, he tells a story of how he pulled through with the professional help of doctors who helped guide his parents over what to do. They advised that you reduce your alcohol intake daily. And each day I'd be buying another bottle of vodka, but giving you a little bit less each day. What was it like having to give me... Well, I'm feeding you the stuff that's killing you. Yeah, so it was just dreadful. But you stuck by me, didn't you? And I'm so grateful that you did. Oh, I just think it's a miracle, Toby. And I just... And Toby joins us now. Toby, thanks for talking to us about this. Just see from that clip how tough it's been for your, for your parents, your dad there. What was the moment for you when you realised that you had a problem that you needed to address? It actually took me years to realise that, that I had a problem with alcohol, that I was an alcoholic. Um, I started drinking a bottle of vodka every single evening when I was about 20. So I was drinking every night and that soon turned to two. And before I knew it, I was drinking in the mornings as well. But I just didn't realise how much of a problem I had until I was about 23 when I first went to rehab because the addictive part of your brain, it's constantly telling you, no, you don't have a problem, you don't have a problem, to get you to drink more, and it's a constant battle. So it actually took me years to, to realise that I was an alcoholic and accept and it. The, the programme that's airing tonight is called Are You Drinking Too Much? And, you know, it was a question you had to ask yourself. It's a question that many people are asking themselves now, especially after lockdown, the uncertainty, the anxiety of the pandemic. We know that more and more people are drinking too much alcohol, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, last year we, we had the highest number of deaths in England and Wales, mm. alcohol-specific deaths from, um, in, in, from, for 20 years. So it, it really does. It, it scares me to death to think that thousands, if not millions of people are potentially on the verge of, of going down the path that I went down and ending up being in a place where I was because it is the worst place you can possibly imagine and I would not wish it on my worst enemy. And, and Toby, you mentioned there and we saw in the clip just how upset your parents were, but they've also been an incredible support to you. And it also shows how hard it is for family and friends of people who have an addiction and may not even realise. For anyone who is watching, they're worried about themselves or they're worried about a loved one, where can they go to get help? OK, so there's, there's, there's loads of charities out there that, that can help people who, have, who are relatives of people that have alcohol issues, uh, such as ADFAM. But the thing that really helped my dad and helped me get through it, because I don't think he would have, I genuinely don't think my dad would have got through it without this, is he would tell everyone about what was going on. He would just talk to people and get that weight off his shoulders. That was his outlet. And it was the same for me. That's what eventually was the key for me um, getting sober, is I started talking about, honestly about my addiction and what was going on in my head and when I get a craving. And, and that's the key for everyone, I think, just talking, talking okay. and accepting you have a problem. Well, listen, Toby, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for talking to us this lunchtime. Thank you. And uh, you can watch Toby's programme, Are You Drinking Too Much, tonight at 7.30pm right here on ITV. Well, next, a black actor has taken the lead role of Christine in The Phantom of the Opera for the first time in the show's 35-year history. Lucy St. Louis wasn't even born when the musical first opened in the West End. She's been telling Faye Barker about the thrill of opening night. It was the most magical moment of my life, standing there um, and taking my vows and receiving the response that I had from the audience was so overwhelmingly beautiful. And it was 
amazing to feel accepted, especially being the first black woman to play this role in the West End and on Broadway. Um, and if my younger self could see this now, she would be screaming inside with pure joy and happiness. <laughs> It's a role that was made famous 35 years ago by Sarah Brightman, one yeah. of the most iconic in musical theatre. Yeah. Did you ever imagine yourself as a little girl that you would yourself be able to play this part? No, I didn't, um, but I loved this show so much and I loved the score and the story and I just hoped and prayed that one day that I could take on this huge, momentous role and, um, yeah, hard work and a lot of dedication and yeah and it's finally paid off <laughs> and for other black performers what message does this send do you think to help your colleagues in the industry yeah I think it says never give up you can be here and you are seen and you can be heard and you are valued and you are celebrated and this goes to show it right now and um, I am so grateful that I'm in this position to be able to hopefully pave the way and have a lot of inspiration for my fellow performers of colour. Well, Lucy, thank you so much. Thank you. So this is 35 years of an iconic show that continues to bring the house down, but is also now breaking boundaries. Oh, Faye Barker speaking to Phantom of the Opera star Lucy St Louis. And finally, after 17 years of competitions that have launched some of the biggest pop acts out there, from Little Mix to One Direction, The X Factor is set to leave our screens. ITV has confirmed there are no current plans for another series of the talent show that also brought us the likes of Jedward and Chico. Sangeeta Lau reports on the end of a reality TV institution. It's produced some of the biggest pop stars of all time. One Direction! And unearthed many who thought they should be. London's got the X Factor! I have the X Factor! All of my dreams have a away. Just like its contestants, X Factor had humble beginnings. Stolen moments from a laminate floor stage that we share to one of the biggest live you audiences. Well, I'll say. A chance to get a taste of showbiz. But now, a show that found some of the most unique acts could be gone forever after ITV announced there are no current plans for another series. To me, it's sad that it's come to an end because it was something that brought us all together and we could actually sit down as a family with all generations and watch it. It's a show that gave duos like Jedward a chance in the spotlight and created some of the biggest boy bands too. Now though it seems X Factor has had its time. Matt. Something 2016 winner Matt Terry says is a huge loss. It changed so many people's lives, not just the contestants, you know, also this country, you know, the first, the peak, what was it, the first five, five years of it, People absolutely loved it. Not just for the stars it found, but the drama too. After 17 years, X Factor is stepping out of the spotlight. But like many pop bands, there's always chance of a reunion. Sangeeta Lal, ITV News. Chico time. Uh, that is it this lunchtime. Mary will be here with the evening news at 6.30. The news for you are follows the national weather. But for now, from everyone on the team here, bye-bye.